Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to the Justice System and State of Exception Research Group channel, which is a very big name. Uh, we're back with our series of lectures with guest professors from around the world to um, address topics basically related to our research, uh, which you can find in our collective book, for example, Liquid Authoritarianism and Constitutional Crisis, launched uh, this year by Editora Forum. And also here in our YouTube channel, uh, the videos that consist of lectures, debates, uh, group meetings, etc. Uh, today, we have the great honor to welcome Professor Michael Wilkinson, who, who is Associate Professor of Law at London School of Economics, LLC, uh, the author of, uh, of the book Authoritarian Liberalism and a Transformation of Modern Europe by Oxford University Press uh, this year as well. Actually, last year. Oh, there it is. He's showing it already to us. <laughs> Um, he's held uh, also visiting professorships at Cornell, at Paris 2, the, Internet, the National University of Singapore, and KU University. And his work has been translated to Portuguese, which is very interesting for us, uh, Italian, Spanish, and Turkish. So, Professor, it is a great honor to have you here with us, uh, even if virtually. <laughs> Thank you uh, so much once again for accepting our invitation with such kindness and, and promptness. Uh, unfortunately, Professors Pedro and Luis had last minute commitments and will not be able to participate appearing here on the screen, but we did all this work prior to this recording uh, altogether. And to our researchers, thank you very much for sending questions and, and provocations of debates through the form that we sent in our WhatsApp group. Uh, they will be the basis for our second moment today uh, after Professor Wilkinson's initial presentation about his ideas contained in the book, as I mentioned, uh, Authoritarian Liberalism and the Transformation of Modern Europe. So, um, Professor, thank you once again for your presence. The virtual floor is yours. Thanks very much, Natalia. Um, thanks very much for the for the invitation uh, to to talk. It's a, a huge pleasure to do this. I can only think of one thing that would, would have been better, which was to to be in Brazil myself. But um, maybe maybe another time. Uh, so it's I suppose one of the advantages of this um, technological revolution is being able to talk to a, a group of people from the comfort of your uh, own uh, office or home home office in this case. Um, so I'm going to talk about my book, the, um, the book that, well, let me give you the title, Authoritarian Liberalism and the Transformation of Modern Europe. Um, I'm going to talk for about half an hour and then um, we will have some, some question and answers. So, um, let me just show you the cover of the book, uh, which gives immediately a sense of the um, historical um, aspect of the work. Uh, the, the title itself, Authoritarian Liberalism, is meant to capture this combination of forms, um, political authoritarianism and economic liberalism. And the, the, the term is um, sometimes unsettling, particularly for liberals who like to think of their ideology as being some, somehow inherently uh, democratic. But the, um, the, the, the term emerges in the interwar period um, as a way of recounting how liberals turn to authoritarianism out of a, a fear of mass democracy. And in particular, a fear that mass democracy in combination with um, political parties representing the working class might undermine the bourgeois Reichstag, to use the, 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 the German term, the, 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 the liberal rule of law that protects private property in particular, and also, uh, maintain something of a separation between the political and the economic spheres. So that's a, a working sort of definition of liberalism. Um, and this trajectory that is mapped in the book begins with that interwar episode, the, the breakdown, if you like, of liberal democracy, and then traces how across various stages, historical periods, uh, authoritarian liberalism takes different forms, but at each moment, in each epoch, as a way of entrenching this uh, 
differentiation of the political and the economic, um, in large part by depoliticizing the economy, taking things away from the demos. Um, uh, and in, in both formal ways and informal ways. So the book looks at interstate relations, state society relations, and social relations. And I look, because it's a book of constitutional theory, I do look at the various institutional and legal devices that are used to constrain democracy. But I also go beyond that and look at various cultural factors, material factors, um, um, and this demobilization of the masses, uh, which is a facet of authoritarian liberalism. The cover, as well as trying to convey that sense of a historical dynamic, um, the cover contains a picture by uh, Paul Clay that was uh, famously uh, acquired by Walter Benjamin and inspired his thesis on the philosophy of history. And this, uh, uh, in, in Benjamin's reading, this picture depicts the angel of history, the Angelus Novus, that is looking back at the past, this pile of rubble that is um, uh, the, the result of historical uh, progress, <laughs> ironically, because, of course, Benjamin sees the catastrophe piling up um, being the angel is being pushed into the future by the wind that he ironically calls progress. And Benjamin uh, features a couple of times in the book, but it's an important cameo appearance because Benjamin was very critical of uh, uh, social democracy in Germany in the interwar period and prescient of the impending collapse and descent into fascism. Um, uh, viewing a sort of um, vulgar materialism as being problematic um, in denying the sort of agency of the, the working class. And so that sort of features in the book in various, in various ways. Um, let me give you the structure of the book, because it's, it's, quite, it's quite difficult to present the entire book in half an hour, but I will say a little bit about each of these four parts. So I've just mentioned the uh, emergence of um, authoritarian liberalism in the interwar period. And that takes up part one of the book, uh, where I look at both the phenomenon in, in, in late Weimar, just before the, the Nazis seized power, but also using Karl Polanyi, I show that this uh, uh, phenomenon of authoritarian liberalism is much more widespread and goes uh, uh, beyond Germany and in fact even beyond Europe. Um, Polanyi picks up various parts of the global economy which are uh, reflect similar uh, uh, phenomena. And then in part two of the book I look at how the um, form and structure of economic liberalism is reconstituted in this way that I refer to as a more passive authoritarian liberalism, uh, based in large part on demobilization, de-democratization, um, and the emergence of new ideologies of order liberalism and neoliberalism. This takes us until um, the Maastricht Treaty, which coincides with the fall of the Berlin Wall and this period um, that Francis Fukuyama famously referred to as the end of history. But in fact, in my retelling, uh, I present it as the end of the end of history. It's actually a new, a new beginning, a moment at which this um, passive authoritarian liberalism becomes contested. And we see this series of movements and counter movements which raise various questions about the return of sovereignty, the return of an alternative to um, economic liberalism, in large part uh, galvanized by the, by the political right. In fact, one of the, the, the things that I'm thinking about since um, finishing the book is, is why um, this kind of rupture uh, or this disequilibrium is rather seized strategically by the right and the left is rather 
unable to to benefit from it. And then I look in the final part of the book at the the last uh, decade or so since the financial crisis, uh, the the euro crisis, where a lot of these dynamics come to a uh, a head um but there is no resolution so we see authoritarian liberalism strongly contested also now from the left if we think about for example the syriza party in greece which is elected on an anti-austerity platform in 2015 we see the rise of podemos in spain um and, and yet this, these, these reactions um, are relatively ineffectual in changing the, the dynamic. And I try to, 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 to explain why that is the case. And I'll, I'll conclude on that point um, at the end of the talk. So the, so it, the book takes this historical um, structure, looking at these four periods of history and the way they evolve uh, in one into another. Um, but the, the, in my mind, the book begins uh, with the Euro crisis itself. So I began to think more uh, seriously about this issue of authoritarian liberalism at the height of the Euro crisis. I mentioned a moment ago the election of Syriza. At the top is the, um, uh, the Alexis Tsipras, who was the, the, the leader of uh, Syriza and the Greek prime minister during the, the height of the euro crisis and then uh, was uh, after the Ochi referendum where the Greece, Greeks voted no to the uh, austerity memoranda um, and then he capitulated uh, to the creditors was described as a, as a, as a coup this is the, this is a coup hashtag on the right we have Mario top right we have Mario Draghi the uh, president of the European Central Bank which became much more active during the euro crisis and in ways which were highly legally and constitutionally dubious, both as a measure, uh, a matter of EU law because of the limited mandate of the bank in the, in the treaties, and also as a matter of domestic constitutional law. Um, um, and there were a series of challenges raised in the German constitutional court. Uh, there were also a, a raising of the, the idea of the euro as the, the single currency as central to the success or failure of the project. So right in the center, we have Angela Merkel, the chancellor of, of Germany during this period. And um, she notably suggested that if the Euro fails, Europe fails. So now this project of European integration becomes tied um, very directly and symbolically to the currency itself. Um, on the bottom, we have Emmanuel Macron, uh, who starts to emerge in the, the domestic context as this strong um, executive power, described often now um, as an authoritarian liberal in the context of the French political scene, where Macron is uh, um, uh, frequently bypassing the traditional representative democracy and imposing executive emergency measures. Uh, Jupiter, describing himself in this sort of Jupiterian terms of this strong leader, um, but from but from a position of political centrism, where he represents a party which is more or less uh, a party of the political centre. Um, so, when I first started thinking about the Euro crisis in about 2012, which is now now 10 years ago, it makes me feel a little bit old. Um, I was asked by a colleague to write a, an, an article on my reflections on the Euro crisis. And it, it struck me that what was um, emerging, particularly in the way that Greece was being treated by the, um, the Troika, but also the Eurogroup and also various domestic constituencies, was something like this uh, a combination of political authoritarianism, uh, basically discarding Greek democracy, discarding a popular mandate in the referendum, but ostensibly in furtherance of this project of economic liberalism, albeit now a project that um, was very uh, closely tied to neoliberal uh, 
um, dereg deregulation, privatization, austerity, and, and so on. And then I began to realize that actually this, this combination of political authoritarianism and economic liberalism had a much longer history. Um, and so I began to do more historical research. And it turned out that actually a number of authors uh, uh, in very, very different contexts, including Renato Christie, um, uh, Kanishka Jaya Surya, so that the, had picked up on the on this on this uh, this term authoritarian liberalism, which, um, as I mentioned earlier, begins in Weimar. Um, and so, what a lot of commentators were noticing were these parallels between the um, uh, Euro crisis moment. And again, this is this is a more global story, but I'm going to focus on Europe. I mean, maybe that's something that we can look at in question and answer. These parallels between what was happening in the last decade since the Euro crisis and the interwar breakdown of liberal, uh, liberal democracy. And there were a number of striking parallels, um, not least of, in the, the return of the uh, idea of the exception, uh, the jurisprudence of Carl Schmitt, um, uh, and the debates that he was engaged in during Weimar. And initially, I thought about analyzing it along those lines, that there was, again, a crisis of the liberal state, again, this turn by um, the liberal uh, kind of elite, political elite, um, in particular to authoritarian politics in this emergency situation. Uh, but I increasingly began to to doubt that the norm exception model would do full justice to the story from then until now. So the book um, became much longer than I initially imagined. And I, I tried to track each of those four um, uh, periods in their evolution. But we begin with, with Weimar and the, the crisis of the liberal state of the long 19th century. This was the moment um, which I mentioned at the start that mass democracy becomes a threat to the establishment. Mass democracy, universal suffrage, which um, uh, first uh, uh, takes, um, takes place in, in 1918 in the Weimar Constitution, in combination with um, mass democratic socialist parties in Germany, of course, both the Socialist Party and the Communist Party, um, and so there is this fear that democracy could turn towards um, socialism, both in a revolutionary, but also a, a, a transitional way. So there was, of course, the fear of the Bolshevik revolution as well. But the fear that Carl Schmitt held as a conservative in this period was that even the ordinary political process could result in an erosion of the, of the uh, liberal Reichstag. And this becomes very clear if we look at Karl Schmitt's um, constitutional theory. This is a quote from the Verfassungslehrer. Um, now the proletariat comes the people that is the bearer of this negativity, which Sayers in the French Revolution referred to as the, the, that which is nothing and shall become everything. It is the part of the population which does not own which does not have a share in the produced surplus value and finds no place in the existing order. Democracy turns into proletarian democracy and replaces the liberalism of the propertied and educated bourgeoisie. Uh, so this is the, 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 the classic um, liberal fear about democracy. And in, and in particular, parliamentary democracy. And in the early stages of Weimar, Schmidt turned to the courts, in fact, um, uh, this is a particular bone of contention amongst uh, among liberals when they find out that Schmidt turned to judicial review in order to protect private property. He soon realized that wouldn't be sufficient and then turned to the executive um, presidential authoritarianism, which is more he's more commonly associated with. But the, the tendency of liberals is to simply caricature Schmidt. And, and actually, the, the, the reality is much more troubling. Um, Christie, Renato Christie um, picked up on this. Uh, already in the 1990s and wrote a book entitled Carl Schmidt and Authoritarian Liberalism. Uh, other authors like 
uh, William Scheuermann have picked up on the similarities and affinities between Carl Schmidt and Friedrich Hayek. And what Christie notes is that at this early stage, what, what was the, the kind of motivating fear for Schmidt was the democratic uh, revolution. This is a, a point that was identified at the time uh, uh, in, in a piece which first coins the term authoritarian liberalism. And it was coined by a German social democrat, Hermann Heller, a social democrat and constitutional theorist, who was a sort of arch rival of, of, of Schmidt, um, not as well known. Um, most of the, the, the debate focuses on, on Schmidt versus Kelsen. Kelsen is a sort of a third figure in this um, debate where Kelsen is, Kelsen's position is more of a sort of formal jurisprudential um, uh, uh, pure, pure theory of law, whereas Heller uh, adopts uh, a quite standard social democratic position, um, but notes tragically late in 1932, he, he dies the following year in, um, in Spain, where, he, where he's been exiled after the, Na the Nazis seize power. He note, notices this combination of features of, of, a, of a state which has turned towards authoritarian means in order to secure the capitalist economy. And he describes this as authoritarian liberalism, this bypassing of normal um, uh, representative democracy under the so-called cabinets of the barons. These are the three chancellors ruling Germany before the Nazis seized power in January 1933. Um, and they are attempting to rule Germany by diktat and decree um, without, uh, without parliament. And of course, with the background of increasing violence on the streets, extra parliamentary violence, um, both on the left and the right. Um, but the, the well, the, the story that I want to tell in relation to this period is that it's not the excess of democracy that leads to fascism, but quite the contrary. It's the suppression of democracy that is the prelude to the, uh, the end of the, uh, the liberal democratic state. It's this suppression, this authoritarian rule, which occurs before the complete... Um, uh, destruction of the uh, of the state through the Nazi uh, party when that takes power in 33. Um, so this is important because there is a myth that takes hold after the Second World War that it is somehow the excess of democracy or the tyranny of the majority that leads to fascism, whereas there is a, 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 a at least a plausible story uh, that tells quite a different uh, message. So when we look beyond it, because of course Weimar was a particular set of circumstances in some ways, but it represented a much broader set of phenomena. And in Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation, he shows how in various contexts, in various countries, both in Europe and outside Europe, there was um, an obstruction of democracy pursued by, by, by liberals, partly ideologically in terms of their um, opposition to any kind of, as he puts it here, reform, planning, regulation, or control of the economy. Um, but that, that uh, exposes this idea of laissez-faire as a complete myth because there was never any laissez-faire as such. The liberals always depended upon a strong state apparatus in order to pursue the uh, free economy. Um, and he traces this back, in fact, across the 19th century. And 
looks at then the period of imperialism and so on. But that's in a sense that that that's my next book project. So we can we can save that for 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 later. But if we just take this moment in the twenties, Polanyi shows how liberals turn to various authoritarian measures in order to maintain the gold standard. That's that's the sort of um, um, global kind of uh, uh, a way in which. Uh, pol the political economies are, are rigidified. They're, 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 they're various um, maneuvers in order to maintain a certain currency, a sound currency in finances. And actually this, this, this quote um, speaks to that quite nicely. This is a quote from, from uh, the Great Transformation in the 1920s. The stabilization of currency became a focal point in the political thoughts of peoples and governments. The restoration of the gold standard became the supreme aim of all organized effort in the economic field. The repayment of foreign loans and the return to stable currencies were recognized as the touchstone of rationality in politics. And no private suffering, no restriction of sovereignty was deemed too great a sacrifice for the recovery of monetary integrity. In other words, it's in order to maintain the what he calls a priori of economic uh, liberalism, democracy would simply be set aside, and uh, in fact, quite brutally in in many instances. Um, so that's sort of gives gives the picture a, a, a broader feel. In fact, Polanyi in the book doesn't say much about Weimar. He focuses more on other contexts, which is which is quite interesting in itself. But it shows that the, the phenomena of authoritarian liberalism is much more global. Now, one more point before we move on to the post-war scene. What was interesting as I began to do more research on the interwar era was the fact that liberals uh, were quite quick in perceiving the failure uh, of classical liberalism. And already in 1938 had begun to regroup um, in order to see how liberalism might be restored. And so the term neoliberalism, which is a kind of a, a slightly overused word in many ways, but um, often is used to point to a particular period later in the 70s and 80s. So in, in the UK with the um, uh, premiership of Margaret Thatcher and in the, in the US with Ronald Reagan's presidency, neoliberalism often referred, is often um, um, referred to to capture the, those decades beginning in the mid 70s. Um, where the economy becomes more highly financialized, there is deregulation of capital controls. There is also this sort of class war fought by um, um, uh, Reagan and Thatcher against the trade unions. But it, and, and that is an important feature of the material changes in the 80s. But the origins of neoliberalism, um, in fact, come come much earlier, and they're already starting to be rethought in the late 1930s, alongside various um, ordo liberals, which is the German version of neoliberalism. And in 1938, there was a colloquium um, based on Walter Lippmann's work. Walter Lippmann was an American conservative who had engaged with uh, debates with John Dewey. Uh, the American pragmatist and radical Democrat, um, where Lippmann argued for a more elite version of uh, democracy, um, whereas Dewey was in favor of this more kind of radical grassroots democracy. And uh, incidentally, Walter Lippmann also apparently coined the term the Cold War, <laughs> uh, which is quite interesting given the, the, the fact that we seem to be back um, using the term again so frequently. And, and in fact, the Cold War is important here because, because of the way in which liberalism um, in the post-war period is pushed particularly strongly through American involvement in European reconstruction. Um, and that's our next, the next stage of our story because the, the Second World War intervenes 
Um, and liberalism isn't really re-founded or reconstituted until the 1950s. And so the second part of the book traces the way in which economic liberalism is put on a new foundation. And this is a slightly more complicated story because I look at it in three ways, both in terms of interstate relations, socioeconomic relations and state society relations. Um, and in each of these ways, we can identify a certain transformation. So sovereignty, and again, I'm talking specifically about Europe, but it would be interesting to see how this resonates elsewhere. Sovereignty is restrained specifically in the European context through the um, emergence of European integration, the first um, treaty, the Treaty of Coal and Steel, and then the Treaty of Rome, which create this uh, uh, the, or lay the foundations for a single market in Europe. In combination with the, the Cold War um, emerging uh, in, in between the USSR and the USA, which makes sovereignty in Europe something of, a, of an illusion. Then there's the, the way in which capitalism itself is to a degree tempered in, in Western Europe. Um, partly because of the sort of legacy of the war itself. So there is a kind of a massive reconstruction effort. There has been uh, 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 an increase in, um, in the bargaining power of labor vis-a-vis -vis capital in the, the so-called tronc glorieuse, as the French refer to those 30 years after the Second World War in between 1945 and 1975. And thirdly, a constraining of the democratic ethos. And these three things kind of coexist slightly uneasily, but in relation with, with one another. And I'm going to focus on the third one, um, although we can certainly talk about the others in uh, our question and answer. So constrained democracy. And the term constrained democracy is meant to capture not only the sense of elites being uh, afraid of the people, which is certainly true, but that because of this myth I mentioned earlier taking hold, there is also a sense that the people are afraid of themselves. This is, this is perhaps a particularly German story. And we can see how, for example, in Italy and France, this takes a slightly different form. And we have, we do have um, in the 60s in Italy and France, a kind of uh, a return of, of uh, protest. And, and, and I, I'll say something about that as well if I have time. But in the German context, which sort of forms the backbone of the book, there is a turn away from mass democracy and towards technocracy, managerialism, integration through law, the role of lawyers becomes very significant, both domestically and in the creation of this European constitution, which I'll come to in a moment. And Christian democracy, um, which is a very powerful movement as a matter of political party structure, um, builds on the anti-communism of the Cold War era. Um, but there's more to it than that. And I want to suggest that there is also a certain turning away of democracy on the part of the working class themselves, in part based on these sort of myths that are um, um, produced. But there is a turn towards consumerism, away from the idea of citizenship. And this, as, as Hannah Arendt quite intriguingly diagnoses in the 1950s, she says in her reports written contemporaneously on the German political scene, that because of the sort of failures of uh, as, as it's seen, the failures of social democracy in the interwar period, um, the working class um, becomes uh, less of an active agent. And I say that in the book, this, this is only part of the story because another important part of this story is that the working class is abandoned by the uh, political elites, including by the parties that had previously represented them. So the German Social Democratic Party basically abandons class politics, abandons uh, Marxism officially in the late 1950s. Um, uh, and so 
there is both a sort of withdrawal of the working class, but also um, an abandonment of the working class. What then, what then comes to replace um, uh, democracy as an ideology? Well, in the order liberal mind, it's very much economic freedom. Economic freedom comes to substitute for political freedom. And I mentioned German order liberalism a moment ago, and order liberals were quite explicit about this, about seeing democracy as leading to totalitarianism, potentially. Um, of course, it's a version of Hayek's uh, road to serfdom, the notion that democracy leads to some form of, 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 of social uh, servitude. And they replace the idea of political freedom with the notion of economic freedom as the legitimating device for the whole constitutional order. Again, this was only really picked up on recently, but as whenever, and this is a sort of a point of method in the book, whenever I was able to, I would use contemporaneous sources to show that this, this wasn't just something that was being read to history from a present perspective, but it actually was identified by various authors at the time. Franz Neumann, the Frankfurt School theorist, wrote in 1953 already that political freedom was disappearing, um, alienation from democratic political power was increasing in Europe at a tremendous speed. This is a, a, a quote from a, a, a rejoinder that I recently wrote uh, in response to some critics of, of my book. Um, so this, what I call a passive authoritarianism emerges because unlike in late Weimar, when the authoritarianism was sort of active, both in terms of a, of, a, a very um, direct bypassing of parliament and in terms of the kind of background violence on the streets, the post-war version is more about demobilizing the masses or um, to uh, mobilization to inaction <laughs> that sort of captures that a strange, a strange sort of paradox. Uh, the official abandonment of class struggle by social democratic and even communist parties, the Euro communist parties of this era, gradually, and again, it doesn't take place overnight, but in the decades following um, post war reconstruction, the communist parties. Uh, in Italy particularly, become de-radicalized, move away from any um, promise of revolution. And the, the bourgeoisie becomes much more active. You have this transnational bourgeoisie, which is uh, highly influential through various networks in, in Christian democracy, but also juristic networks, various um, uh, uh, legal activists uh, who were creating this new sort of uh, liberal um, constitutional structure. The economic concept, so from a sort of structural perspective, what's been observed is the way in which, um, particularly through Europe integration, there is a kind of an economic constitution constructed which depoliticizes the economy, which insulates the economic domain as far as possible from majoritarian um, influences. So counter-majoritarian institutions are empowered, constitutional courts, independent central banks, the institutions of the European Union themselves. Uh, and I mentioned order liberalism uh, as being a particularly German thing, but you also see how order liberalism becomes influential in other countries, often in quite specific national types. So you know, if we were if we're doing a more granular analysis, we would look in more detail at how it emerges in the French and the Italian and the um, um, Scandinavian and the British countries. So there are important national differences, but there are also important similarities, and these similarities are reinforced by the construction of a European economic constitution, which, to quote Gian Domenico Mioni, an Italian political scientist. Was, a, was, was based on upscaling this classical liberal idea to the supranational level. So now you'd be 
trying to separate politics from economics through creating a supranational constitution, which would constrain the, um, uh, the various member states in, in, in various ways in order to uh, ensure the functioning of the internal market. So you would be constitutionalizing, for example, the free movement of goods, services, workers, and people, uh, work, uh, uh, sorry, goods, services, workers, and capital. Um, and you'd be justifying it through this sort of creation of a level playing field, right, which becomes more and more kind of radicalized as the decades uh, progress. And you get this sort of deregulatory um, uh, bias, which has been shown by authors like uh, Fritz Scharf. Okay, so we, we then sort of get to the third part of the book. So the, the foundational period of what I call passive authoritarianism um, is largely um, uncontested uh, with, the, with some important exceptions until the Maastricht Treaty. And the Treaty of Maastricht is as, as representing this, this era, um, both show certain continuities with passive authoritarianism, but also certain discontinuities. So in terms of the continuities, I think I'll mention two in particular because they are quite important. One is the uh, creation of economic and monetary union, the single currency, which depoliticizes the very medium of exchange, money itself. So the macroeconomic powers of the member states are curtailed through the Maastricht Treaty. And this becomes particularly significant in the Euro crisis when countries like Greece and Italy and Spain are not able to use, for example, currency devaluation in, to in order to re regain some competitive advantage. So you have the upscaling of money itself becomes constitutionalized. But you also have the widening of the European Union after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which very dramatically changes the geopolitical scope of Europe from being a relatively discrete body of 12 members to, by 2008, a much bigger body of 28 members, including countries of Central and Eastern Europe which undergo what was diagnosed in the 90s as this sort of shock therapy, right? because these countries undergo a, a, a very swift and brutal transition to free market economies after having been under Soviet domination. Um, and the, 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 the story of kind of re-entering the West is one which is highly asymmetric because there's a lot of attention given to establishing liberal uh, economies, but very, very, relatively little to it creating the kind of democratic institutions of a robust um, political democracy. So that's the continuity. So continuity both in terms of the project of economic liberalism, but also an expansion in size. But there are also some discontinuities. Um, and these pictures are meant to, 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 to highlight a couple of them. On the bottom left is the German Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe, which starts to um, present a series of challenges to further integration, ostensibly to protect its own democratic identity, its own constitutional identity, which now, of course, is a big term, um, but it's one that emerges out of the, the jurisprudence of the German Constitutional Court. In the, on the middle bottom, uh, we have Jean-Marie Le Pen, the leader of the Front National, which in the 90s starts to accumulate more support. Of course, now we have his daughter, Marine Le Pen, um, as the, the potentially second um, um, uh, candidate in the presidential elections in France. But we, we can already identify at this time a, um, uh, a sort of disequilibrium which the, the right is, is electorally benefiting from because the status quo appears increasingly untenable, but the left has sort of partly retreated from class politics and partly um, attached its flag to the master of European integration in such a way that there doesn't seem to be any alternative. And 
On the bottom right is Jürgen Habermas, the uh, famous German philosopher associated as, with the Frankfurt School, one of the sort of second generation Frankfurt School theorists, who in the 1990s starts discussing the idea of the post-national constellation, uh, deliberative democracy becomes this sort of ideal means by which Europe can um, uh, unite, um, increasing this disconnect between the, the, the demos um, and the uh, ideal projections, idealist projections of uh, various um, left philosophers, uh, liberal left, let's say, in the case of, of, of Habermas. And so to, to use Peter Meyer's term, there is this disconnect emerging between uh, uh, the political elites and the peoples, or as I would say, actually, the disconnect was already there, but it's exaggerated now. And um, uh, the disconnect is, is, is exaggerated also by the fact of critical theory uh, uh, disappearing um, into this post-national uh, ethos. Okay, again, uh, this was identified at the time. And in, in 1992, when the French were asked to um, uh, vote on the Maastricht Treaty, the treaty only barely scraped by, by 51% to 49%. This is the so-called uh, petit oui, the, the little yes on the Maastricht Treaty. And a French political philosopher, Marcel Gaucher, identified this as um, representing a cleavage between the elites and, and the people. As early as, this is a quote from my book, as early as 1990, French political philosopher Marshall Gaucher had captured this phenomenon with the metaphor of a wall emerging between the elites and the people, between an official respectable France, which prides itself on its noble feelings and a country of the marginalized, the ignoble, bitter from the den denial even that it exists. Um, and the this was partly emerging because of the by now the total collapse of the Communist Party, which left the working class, um, uh, um, but also given the Socialist Party had moved towards the center by this stage, had left them, left them really without uh, 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 an, an, an obvious support uh, and were turning towards the Front National uh, already in the 1990s. Um, and this is important because everyone talks about authoritarian populism now as if it emerged out of the blue. But of course, there are um, uh, much earlier uh, um, preludes to this um, uh, phenomenon. OK, so what, what this establishes is now we're back to the present, if you like. And, and this is the final part of the book where I try to bring together the, the various sort of threads of this story. Um, there has been a demobilization. There is briefly a flicker of, um, uh, well, more than a flicker, there is a genuine sense of a, uh, an uprising. Again, this is global in scope if you think about the Occupy movements of the early 2010s. Um, there are various social movements which are generating a, a quite a high degree of contestation of the, 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 uh, the status quo, including from, from the left, but they, they come to relatively little. Um, and what I try to explain in the final part of the book is why this conjuncture, which seems to um, be a, a kind of a series of conflicting and ideas, tensions, legal battles, um, um, why it is ultimately irresolved, uh, why it's not resolved. And there are three reasons I give for this. And this is the last, I've actually talked for much longer than I, than I had promised, but I'm coming to, <laughs> I, am coming, <laughs> I am coming to the end now. Um, so this is the, the final part of the book, which I call the unfinished conjuncture. And I say there are three reasons for this. One is that there is no regional hegemonic stabilizer. So Germany, which becomes 
more powerful, in part because of the weakness of the other countries. It's not that Germany is necessarily economically that strong, but only by relative standards. The Franco-German partnership starts to collapse because Germany becomes stronger than, um, significantly stronger than France economically. But it's, and I use this term semi-hegemony because Germany isn't powerful enough to become the hegemonic stabilizer in the way that Charles Kindleberger described the US or described his wish that the US had become a hegemonic stabilizer in the interwar period. Um, Germany isn't that kind of a power, not least because it hasn't the uh, military uh, power to be, take on that role. Even economically, it's powerful enough to, uns to destabilize the balance of powers, but not powerful enough to act as the benign hegemon, um, to the extent that such a such a thing is 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 a feasible or desirable thing in any case. But um, there is a core peripheral dynamic now with the euro crisis. It becomes much evident, much more evident that you have these um, core periphery dynamics, both in terms of the north and the south, as it's usually referred to, even though that's a slightly crude analysis because you have countries like Ireland in the north, which are part of the debtor states. And, and you have the core peripheral dynamic in terms of east and west. Um, so you do have something like a concentric circles, but it seems that from the perspective of German capital, there is actually a, a rationality to its project of austerity because Germany is increasingly turning outside the EU uh, in, in terms of its um, trade uh, uh, outlook. Um, so Germany doesn't have either the interest anymore or the power to become a sort of balancer. Secondly, any power that is exercised by Germany, and this goes for other countries, takes place within the constitutional features of a federation. In other words, there isn't a single um, source of power in the way that you know you can point to the U.S. president as having something like an uh, untrammeled executive power, uh, or not an untrammeled. Let's let's hope. But I mean, well, we can we can debate that. But um, that that simply doesn't exist in in the EU with these multiple centers, these multiple guardians of the constitution, this polycentric, complex, multi-level um, uh, uh, governance regime where you have the member states each exerting power, but you also have the European Central Bank, the European Commission, the European Court of Justice. Um, so there, there is, again, a constitutional structure which sort of prevents a hegemonic um, rebalancing. But the final point, and this is the one that I try and focus on in the book, because I do want to um, ultimately foreground this question of democracy. What I say is that in the final analysis, the the reason for this, the structure to, main, to be maintained is the lack of alternatives in the constitutional imagination, in the democratic imagination. And there are two uh, features of this. One is that on the right, and I mentioned uh, the Front National, Jean-Marie Le Pen, now um, uh, Marine Le Pen, um, those, and in Hungary and Poland, you have governments have in power, which are described as authoritarian populist. But in fact, they have no need or desire to rupture from the status quo because they are simply co-opted by the European institutions themselves. And in fact, often emulated by them. Uh, if you think about von der Leyen, uh, the commission of von der Leyen's talk about a European way of life, very much echoing the, uh, the um, language of the populists in terms of protecting Europe against uh, immigration from the outside. So that's one thing. These, um, these what I call authoritarian illiberalism and authoritarian liberalism actually coexist, even though they are rhetorically contesting one another. There isn't an actual uh, material um, rupture. Secondly, to the extent that there could be a material rupture from the left, um, there is a, a, a lack of genuine alternatives, particularly when it comes to exiting the EU. So the uh, Greek um, economist Kostas Lapovitsas has been one of the few uh, voices arguing that in order to 
to push a democratic socialist project, one would actually have to at least table the possibility of exit from the system. He's very much a lone voice. And in the, in the uh, conclusion to the book, I pick up on Yanis Varoufakis's um, position, which although rhetorically is, is one of left-wing contestation, actually Varoufakis himself admitted to wanting to act as the stabilizer and had uh, no plan B when, they re when Greece really needed the plan B, uh, when they were negotiating with, with the creditors. Not to say it was easy, because of course there was a huge asymmetry in bargaining power, but what Greece needed in order to make something of that position was a genuine uh, alternative. Um, so I, I kind of want also to acknowledge the failures of the left in this period in um, uh, uh, developing a strategy, um, but also say that part of the reason that they couldn't develop this strategy or found it difficult to develop this strategy was because of the decades of authoritarian liberalism that had eroded this sense of political freedom, of democratic collective autonomy. Um, and that is my conclusion. It's not a very, uh, it's not a very happy conclusion, um, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, I'm sort of to this quote Gramsci on the pe pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. But Gramsci sort of slightly overquoted at the moment. Um, so I will simply leave you uh, with with that thought. And um, once again, say thanks to Natalia. Uh, and I'm very happy to, to take some questions. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. I mean, I could literally stay here and listen to you talk all day because it, it dialogues so much with my research and our researchers' research <laughs> and our professors, what they think. I mean, it's wow. It dialogues a lot. We should think about some projects together because <laughs> we, be we do dialogue so much. Yeah, that, that, would, that would be awesome. I'm pretty sure uh, all of our research will be profiting a lot from, from this lecture. And some of them have already read your book. Some of them are in the middle or in the beginning of reading. So I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone is going to quote you a lot in their <laughs> articles. Given their away the ending, I shouldn't have given away the ending. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I mean, I, I can tell them it contains spoilers. So, yeah, <laughs> they have to read first and then and then watch the lecture. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, we do have a lot of questions actually. And um, it's more of a provocation, <laughs> I believe, because I understand uh, from the beginning that you, uh, you you have been trying to discuss Europe, of course, and history of European history. And, but the, at the beginning you said something about it goes globally. It goes a little bit to the global, to international level as well. But if we have time, we can go on that. I would love to go deeper on that because my field of study is international law and, and theory of law. So um, I would love to. Uh, and the thing is, you know, uh, actually I have it here. Uh, this is uh, my master dissertation. I mean, it's the, my first book, so please easy on me. <laughs> but it's called Aspects of Exception in International Law. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's the first book of a, a series that our professor Pedro coordinates called Constitution and Crisis. And uh, what I tried to, to point here was that I could see, of course, in the first formal research of my life, <laughs> so it was too, I, I went easy on this. Um, I was 20 years old, I guess, 21. Um, so I tried to point aspects exactly of exception of authoritarianism that I could see in international law, but not just in norms i mean in, in 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 the texts but also in this interrelation in between states and of course uh, here in the americas we have to mention the us over latin american countries we have to mention europe in colonization and new colonization and uh, all those uh, sorts of the fights for power and how it implicates in our politics and our um legal ordinaments i can't I can say it so what I'm, I'm trying right now to do my PhD, and that's why I made this parenthesis uh, beforehand, uh, is actually trying to understand how this theory of exception, if I can call it like this, of course, funded by Carl Schmitt, I believe, uh, and then Benjamin criticizing, and then Agenben, of course, uh, uh, much uh, earlier, actually, uh, recently, I, I want to say. Um, 
what I'm trying to say is that it, it is there's an interrelation between so many aspects. I mean, it's legal and economical and political. Maybe even religion goes in this. Technology nowadays goes in this. So of course, we have to to cut to study, of course. And and it's not possible to study everything, or else we'd spend like many lives. We would have to reincarnate many times <laughs> to study all of these fields. Um, but then at least saying that it's political, it's economic, and it's, uh, what do you say, political, economic, and, and legal, of course, uh, would be like a, a threefold explanation of what exception, how exception works or how authoritarianism mm -hmm. works. So I, I would like to ask you, uh, what do you think in an international level, if I can say in international law, or maybe even in comparative law, I mean, how the states uh, have... Uh, those relation between them, so transnational law or international law. Uh, what is the legal translation of neoliberalism? I mean, how, how does law support? And that's what I'm, I'm trying to find it. And and no, I don't want you to do the work for me. <laughs> I just want to see your opinion. How does law support and maybe even create uh, the basis for neoliberalism to grow so far <laughs> and so much? I mean, uh, how, how do you see this? And I'm talking about, of course, nowadays, but if you want to give a historical view, no problem at all. Okay, yeah, thanks, thanks very much, Natalia. I mean, that, that those are big, big questions. Um, and I, I mentioned, yeah, at the start that th th there are definitely parts of this story that are m much more global in the sense of universal. I mean, these conflicts between liberalism and socialism or between liberalism and democracy, um, are, they certainly transcend the European uh, context. Um, now, outside of that context, as, as the, I think you have rightly identified, there will be, well, I mean, there will be regional features as well, right? So I, I, I suspect that um, the regional features in Europe are very important because of the creation of this uh, very, you know, this, this monster, <laughs> if you like, the European Union, which uh, impacts so strongly on politics, law and economics, to use your three terms. And more than that, in many ways, it sort of has this cultural um, aspect to it, which means that you can almost not criticize the European project without being accused of being uh, somehow some closet uh, nationalist. Um, so it, it, it's it's a it's a it's a very hard beast to uh, to tame. <laughs> um, but the international thing is interesting because one of the features of the post-war era, and, and I mentioned this very briefly, but I didn't go into it, is the role of the uh, Cold War and the U.S. in particular. And if you look, for example, at the Italian case um, it was really a, a a strong intervention by the us um, which prevented for example or at least tried to prevent the communist party in italy in the 19 late 1940s from becoming the party of government so the marshall plan which was this huge injection of cash into the european economies in an attempt to stabilize them, but also in an attempt to prevent um, the, the, the populations turning to communism. Um, they had an enormous impact on domestic parties. Um, so in the Italian context, it, it was made quite explicit that in the elections in 47, 48, that if the communist party were to win, the martial aid would simply be withdrawn. Uh, and there were other uh, uh, pieces of pressure that were put on the domestic constituencies by uh, by the US in order to um, basically ensure that the Christian Democrats were successful. However, I, I didn't want to sort of focus too much on that point. It's certainly an important part of the story. And in fact, also in the 1970s with the, um, the, the so-called Nixon shock and the turn of the US to uh, uh, becoming a, from being a, a productive economy to being a, one 
based more on, on a consumer uh, society and the turn to China that that um, uh, implied. That was also to some extent had a huge imp repercussions on the, on the European economies in the 1970s and the turn to monetarism in Germany. Um, but I, I didn't want to sort of put the story in a way which suggested that everything was simply out of, out of control of the uh, 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 domestic populace. Because although that, that may even be true to some extent, it, it, it sort of imposes this total impotence on us, right? So um, it's, I guess it's getting the right relation of these uh, uh, material um, facts, factors. Um, and, you know, international law plays a role, um, international relations plays a role probably more than international law in some in some respects but that comes then to your question about law and i think what you what you were uh, getting at um was this very big question uh, about the form of law and if i sort of yeah how does the way you put it was how does law and i think you meant there in quite a philosophical sense or a jurisprudential sense how does law support and neoliberalism, or why is it that why is it that the projects of neoliberalism seem so intertwined with legal dynamics? Um, and in some ways, I think this is not new. So again, Polanyi is helpful here in showing how the the creation of the market society um, used the tools of the the legal state in order to. Um, coerce, you know, the criminal law is, a, is, is also uh, utilized here in order to criminalize dissent. Um, the structure of private property and contractual relations, which builds on what, um, to use Pashakanis's idea of the commodity form, right? And that's, you know, irrespective of, of whether we want to go the whole way with Pashakanis. Pashakanis is very useful because he exposes this illusion, right, or this ideological form of the law. Modern law presents us as equal, formally equal subjects, which conceals the reality of inequality between us and among us. Um, and in part, this ideology is, you know, what, what I think what Pasha, what's, What's interesting about Pashikanis is that it's not simply false. It's like, it, it's, it's overall, it gives us a misrepresentation of reality, but there is something like a, an ideology of the legal form, which, which is, is real, <laughs> but it's only a part of the story. I don't know if that, if that makes full sense, but I think we can extrapolate that to international relations. And I know that has been, um, that has been done by scholars in international law who've used the uh, Pashakanis' ideas to highlight this discrepancy between, you know, formally sovereign, e sovereign uh, equality and the reality of domination because of the material inequalities um, that persist. So law is, I think, is... So two things, I think, I would say. One is, is the Pashakanis... Point, um, about the commodity form and the ideology of formal equality. The second point, and this probably is, is, a, is, a, is a different, quite a different point, is to do with how law can substitute for political action. And in fact, I think my book focuses more on that than the first point. So the first point, I think, is very well um, documented by Marxist legal scholars. Um, the second point is perhaps not so self-evident, but um, it, it strikes me that in the, particularly in the context that I was examining, law was coming to substitute for political action. Um, integration through law was actually a, 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 a school of thought, as well as a, a highly active project pursued by um, lawyers. 
in order to uh, um, integrate uh, the economies um, uh, of, of various European member states. And it, again, it can do so, and maybe this is a sort of Pasha Khanna's point, it can do so in a way which sort of happens under the radar to some, to some degree. You know, we, all, we know for, that law is heavily um, um, uh, idealized, but also he heavily dependent upon asymmetries of power. If you look, for example, let's just take the, the, the case in the UK, where you see, for example, that judges um, tend to be from certain socioeconomic backgrounds, certain they tend to be male, they tend to be white, they tend to be educated in elite institutions. Um, so there is there is also this class bias built into the um, uh, the legal system. Um, I mean, the, I mean, the, I mean, the political system probably isn't much better, but at least it there is the there is the the promise of representation. Um, um, and, and I understand why people look to the law for recourse, and it can be useful in a strategic instrumental way, using um, using the, the law uh, to um, pursue certain progressive goals. But we have to understand the limits of that, right? And that, that it, it is a severely limited strategy um, in terms of trying to uh, make some sort of social change, which can't only be undertaken through through law. That's exactly it. Thank you. I mean, it feels like like a stab in the heart when we 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 perceive that law should be the shield of protection of people against inequality, for example, and so many other injustices. But um, in the end, actually, it's used to to maintain inequality because if we have at least if we uh, take a look at those three areas i mean politics economic and, and and economy in general and and law i mean if we have social rights for example we have that in one of our questions uh from our researchers if we have social rights economic rights etc uh on the paper <laughs> written in the paper but mm. we have in the political side and the economic side it pushing it back i mean how can mm. we have it effective how can we render this effective it's not gonna happen unless we change all of this yeah. together and international law of course we have this uh highly uh, criticizing opinions that it's not actually international it's 99 percent western law mm -hmm. <laughs> imposed into the whole world perhaps not even the whole world but when you talk about the un almost the whole the whole world and without taking into consideration that some some economies want to change. I mean, why why does Brazil have to export always the same things and buy all, always the same things? When we started to change this, and um, I don't know if, if you got in touch with this debate exactly in 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 the beginning of this century, we we were rising. <laughs> I mean, our mm -hmm. economy was rising. Uh, we had almost I don't know twelve or sixteen years of. Um, well, our our economy rising in general. I, I'm not into. Uh, all those data of economic <laughs> uh, statistics, but I mean, we, we, we could perceive that it was rising. And then um, we had some touches of um, American politics and economics <laughs> in here that caused a, a boom in, in many aspects. We had uh, in electoral aspect, we had in, in our own economic aspect, we had even in um, criminology ex aspect. I mean, in, in criminal law, as you mentioned, we've had uh, uh, many operations, as we say, right, from from, from federal police and, and state police. We had many operations that actually um, have, how can I say, <laughs> without being too hard on this, <laughs> that, um, have changed the electoral spectrum of people who could participate and should be able to participate um, in elections, and then they were uh, stopped from that. And what happened later is that, okay, we made a mistake, and our Supreme Court said, sorry, we, we made a mistake, we had some interpretations that we shouldn't have had, and then everything is normal again. I mean, not everything, but most of the things are normal again, so we're having fair elections now. Um, Okay, this is not what should have happened, and we, it was clearly, unless uh, we consider some other opinions who say it was just destiny. I do not believe this, um, but we we have some 
interference, like very hard interference from the U.S. And I, and I say this to all my uh, American colleagues. I mean, we have some really hard interference from the U.S. because our economy was changing. I mean, uh, Mercosur was going to be much stronger than it is right now. It was almost lost. And then we almost made it uh, a step forward into uh, all those divisions of how uh, the economic uh, unit works. And um, I mean, we, we went down. <laughs> in 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 a couple yeah. of years because of this interference and i can see that it, it already happens because uh in the whole world because neoliberalism needs this status quo as you said to be kept in order mm -hmm. to profit from it and it's usually elite né? as you as, as you well said of course mm -hmm. okay let me stop uh, discussing <laughs> what i believe <laughs> and uh let me mention some some other questions from from our researchers So, Geraldo, he says, let, let me just check here, he sent, um, hello, professor, of course, thank you for your lecture. He was speaking about the future already. <laughs> And then he says, uh, okay, you, you believe that post-war constitutional theories were not enough to contain the authoritarian character that the market economy has uh, to the detriment of democracy in European countries. Then I would like to know if you have had time to reflect on this phenomenon in other regions. I mean, you already mentioned mm. it, but, uh, such as the case of Latin America, he says, of course, because we are here, uh, where the ideals of liberal democracies arrived quite late and the effects of authoritarian liberalism destroyed the democracies of these countries more quickly and sharply. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, great, great question. So, so um, I mean, I should preface you know what i what i what i say with with the fact that to really kind of grasp these various um contexts one has to have a, a good deal more knowledge than i do about the various so my you know my my focus is on is on europe but it's interesting that What, when you were asking the question, I was thinking, of, of course, of um, of Pinochet in in um, Chile, and this is one of the uh, areas of that has been researched, um, uh, in, in particularly in terms of this combination of political authoritarianism and economic liberalism. Um, so there probably have been some instances um, in Latin America of much more brutal form of authoritarian uh, liberalism. Um, and in fact, the, I mean, th this, this cropped up when I was presenting um, an earlier version of the book or an article um, which I'd written before the book. Uh, and I think a, a, a South American scholar sort of laughed when I said this was authoritarian liberalism because he said that, you, you know, you haven't seen authoritarianism if you think this is authoritarian. And of course, there's some truth, there's some truth to that, but we don't want to play the sort of, you know, victim Olympics of who's, who's got the worst form of authoritarianism. Um, but what you, but what you, what you, I think would identify in those contexts is the more direct um, influence of America, of the US, as you, as you mentioned, um, often the military performing a more, Uh, prominent role. So in in Europe, uh, in the European context of, of what I describe in the book as, as, as passive authoritarian liberalism, um, this was undertaken in the context of a Europe which was effectively um, divided, right, by two superpowers. <laughs> um, so it, it, it no longer had a kind of um independent foreign policy i mean even the you know the suez crisis the way that was resolved showed that the Fran france and the uk were no longer able to pursue some sort of unilateral um foreign intervention because the us simply wouldn't allow it um and that becomes i think more evident um over the decades as well but then you've got these sort of various splits so for example in Uh, over Iraq, over the Iraq war, where you had the divisions in Europe. So there was, a, there was always a sense in Europe, in, in terms of the U European-America sort of relationship, that 
Okay, so you have NATO, which effectively is um, um, undergirding the entire you know, security structure and foreign policy. But you have splits within Europe, which make it difficult sometimes for, uh, for Europe to speak with one voice. Right? This, this is what Kissinger famously um, uh, 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 complained about. Right? Who do I, you know, if I want to know what uh, Europe's view is on the next US military adventure, uh, I have to call up, you know, 20 different leaders. There isn't one guy I can simply um, uh, negotiate with. Um, so there, there is this slightly sort of uh, demilitarized aspect of post-war Europe, partly because of NATO and, in fact, joining NATO um, um, in the 50s was a, was a, had a big impact on domestic um um, political parties as well, de-radicalizing um, the left parties in Europe. So it had an international but also a domestic um, uh, dimension, but there was a sort of pacification, but only, th only through the auspices of, of NATO on the one hand, and of course the, uh, the, the threat of um, the Soviet Union on the other hand. And the threat of the Soviet Union was also a sort of pacification of the left in a sense because the left the the, the radical left um couldn't couldn't kind of escape the grip of, of stalinism so there was really a lack of independent autonomy of independent thinking um which comes to an end with the cold war uh, with the end of the cold war in the 1990s which is why the maastricht period was so was so interesting um but yeah so so i guess my answer would be that uh, I would need to know more about the specific uh, interrelation in Latin and South America between international relations, American hegemony, domestic um, politics, um, um, in order to to sort of map that further. And I suspect that, but I suspect that the role of the U.S. would play play a more uh, direct role or a more obvious role than in the in the European case where. It's it's there, but it's sort of more more subtle, some in some ways. Um, but yeah, thanks th thanks for that question. Yeah, please thank you for answering. Um, let me go to the next one. It's uh, actually Lillian sent us lots of questions, but considering Geraldo's question and some others, <laughs> well, we'll still talk about. I will just compile them into uh, one. And she says, and please pardon me because I'm translating at the time. <laughs> she said, the idea of um, economic liberalism still attracts voters uh, when used in speeches by populist leaders and, and, and potential autocrats. Why is this rhetoric popular among the people if in practice it would result in a neglect of social policies and individual rights? Okay, yeah, so, I mean, that's a, also a great question. So if we look, for example, at the authoritarian populism in Hungary and Poland, there are there is some um, break from the orthodoxy of neoliberalism, but not, not structurally. So there are some, for example, um, benefits which might be connected to family this kind of it has this weird traditionalist um kind of feature of um connecting it with um uh, catholic catholicism religion uh, family structures so there is a sort of rhetorical inflection from neoliberalism when it mixes with this right-wing version um so i wouldn't necessarily say that they have followed exactly the neoliberal prescriptions in order to become popular. I think they have departed from them. Partly it's a question of rhetoric. So they've re-harnessed the uh, ideology of nationhood, of recalling um, the glory of a past age, the deep conservatism, a cultural conservatism, which is, I think, uh, Again, partly, it's certainly shift from the neoliberalism of the third way, right, of Blair, Jospin, Schroeder. That neoliberalism was tied up with cosmopolitanism, global, globalization. Even again, it was 
I mean, it's hypo you know, hypocritical because it was still very much you know, British jobs for British workers. So there's always this element of uh, uh, um, trying to decipher the meaning of political statements. We can't take them always at face value. Um, but is, is, the, is the electorate entirely persuaded by that? I don't think they are. I mean, this was why it was so interesting that um, in the Greek case, where the voters were very clear in rejecting neoliberalism. And in fact, you know, in the referendum, they were clear about doing it even when they were told that this would be catastrophic. They were still voted no in the uh, uh, to the memorandum and then of course they were effectively betrayed by the by the leaders um the same with the brexit which is why again these you see these ruptures which are quite interesting even though you know brexit is is a whole mess for all sorts of reasons um there was a sense that this was the electorate saying no to the neoliberal status quo of course you can still have neoliberalism outside of the European Union. It's not a, it's not a, it's a sufficient, so it's, it's, you know, it's necessary, but not sufficient, I think, to pursue an alternative um, uh, uh, to exit the, the constraints, the constitutional constraints of the EU. Um, but yeah, why, why do people still vote for neoliberal policies? Firstly, I'm not sure that they do, but to the extent that they, that, that they do, I think we have to look at all the, the, the ways in which the social democratic parties have um, basically dismissed their own constituency. So, yeah, people are not stupid. <laughs> I mean, if social democracy is not off, not only not offering alternative, but in many cases was deepening the neoliberalism of the 20 uh, last year. So, you know, the neoliberalism that was pushed in the 2000s was pushed by centre-left parties in, in Germany, in France, in the UK. Is it a surprise that voters despair of this? Not really. And in fact, I think there's a lot of um, withdrawal from the um, uh, uh, political process. Occasionally, there is a, an, an event which bucks that trend. So it was interesting, for example, in the UK when um, Jeremy Corbyn became the leader and developed this quite, quite strong social mobilization. So you do have these occasions when things um, look like they could throw up an alternative, but then very quickly uh, that's closed down by all um, means uh, possible, which is why it's a, it's a tough task, but one that has to be undertaken. Perfect. Yeah, we've had this, um, let me say, in, in 20 something years, we've had this, uh, this vision in a mini version here in, in, in Brazil, because we've had some uh, left wing presidents elected in for 16 years of mandate. So four, four, four and four again. But then we had this change, as I mentioned, in 2014 slash 2016. And we're still suffering from from this change because we have gone from electing left-wing people mm. <laughs> to extreme right ones, but they didn't say at any time that they were extreme right-wing mm. uh, people. They, they say they're neoliberals. And yeah. then they say, actually, most uh, the president said that and his colleagues, <laughs> uh, they said they were apolitical. So they don't like politics at all. They are just... You know, they, they are taking care of the country as they would take care of an enterprise yeah. or something like this. You know, well, they, this is classic authoritarian liberalism. You know, it, it's the, <laughs> neither left nor right. It's this apolitical managerialism. Uh, it's a demobilization of the people. Um, I mean, it's interesting. You mentioned neoliberalism uh, so much. But I mean, in the next 20 years, something else is going to happen because like even the IMF has basically ditched neoliberalism. Right? No one really yeah. believes in it anymore. I mean, since the pandemic. Um, I think that's changed things. So I think we're going to we're going to be entering some sort of new phase uh, in which uh, 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 there will be some ideological contestation. But that will be for us to come back in ten years' time and see see how things have progressed. True, and then we have another conversation and record it again, and then we'll see what happens. 
<laughs> okay, then um, let me just go quickly so I don't take your time much more. I should I should probably, um, looking at the time, I probably only have time for like one or two more questions because I have, okay. I, I have uh, some children to look after. <laughs> Oh, oh, that would be cute for, for yeah. us to say hello to them. Oh, just kidding. I'm not um, sure if I want to be on the camera, but yeah. Okay, then we just peek to then. Um, I'm going with uh, Ana Flavia, and she uh, asked, can we place social media or social networks? So this is a more recent approach. Um, as an important instrument of authoritarian liberalism in current times, considering that there is often, uh, on the one hand, a false sense of political participation by, for example, actively acting on the networks. Um, on the other hand, uh, an emptying or a manipulation of discussions controlling the affections that circulate in society, considering, for example, the impact of networks on elections and also in the recent, the recent purchase of Twitter by Elon Musk. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh... Wow. So the, the, again, this is a bit, big question, slightly outside my sort of area of, of expertise. But yeah, I can see why. Well, I suppose the, so the first thing I would say is that this sort of concentration of really it's quite extreme monopoly power in the um, uh, area of social media. I mean, you mentioned uh, Twitter and Elon Musk. Um, but we know that you know Facebook is. A, we know the we know the 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 the, the big kind of um, players behind these networks uh, and their influence. Um, well, so so on one hand, we would have to look at the way in which this has kind of created a, a new sort of um, oligopoly of power, uh, and and in ways which are um, certainly part of a new sort of era of surveillance capitalism, right? When virtually everything we do um, is available as data, you know, to be bought and sold. Um, and th this obviously raises serious um, concerns. Um, but I do, I do wonder as well whether the influence of social media isn't slightly exaggerated. I mean, I'm not, I'm, I'm not, hun I'm not convinced either way on this entirely. I keep an open mind, um, but it it does st strike me as a possibility uh, that in order to really sort of contest this, it would have to be done in other ways, right? So we still, you know, we still need the sort of traditional. Um, mechanisms of party membership, of social mobilization. And yes, you know, social media can even, can of course also be used as a tool in order to promote that, but it's not going to be a substitute for it. Um, you know, and ni neither is it going to be ultimately down to Google or Facebook, you know, to pursue the project of authoritarian liberalism. They can certainly be helpful in, in, in um, uh, 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 bolstering the power of government surveillance in particular um, but i don't I, i'd like to think that it wasn't going to be conclusive um but yeah good question okay promise last one and i'll just put together questions from regina lucia lucas and alessandra <laughs> by asking are there is, is actually more philosophical and heartfelt one <laughs> Uh, they ask, are there any chances of overcoming this exception slash authoritarianism through a constitutional dialogue or is the weakening of democracy a part of this neoliberal advance or project? Maybe both. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, yes, it certainly is. So I, I certainly see um, neoliberalism as a, as a, a, fur a further weakening of uh, democracy. Um, in all the ways that I, I explained uh, in the talk. And so it has deep roots. It has, you know, these roots in the interwar era um, when liberals were, I think, quite explicit about wanting to, to um, um, avoid the dangers as they saw it of mass democracy and turn to uh, 
uh, uh, uh, elitist forms of, of governing. But I think the first part of the question was whether there could be a, const a constitutional dialogue to, I mean, so here I, I, I tend to be rather skeptical of constitutionalism, right? And this may be a particularly British thing. And I know this, I, I, I always get in trouble with my continental colleagues who might have much more faith in constitutions and constitutionalism, but I tend to see constitutionalization, let's call it that, as a, um, from a democratic perspective, a rather negative phenomenon. So, and, and even if we sort of look at it in very abstract terms, um, and we see the creation of constitutions as devices really aimed at, um, establishing some kind of entrenched provisions. Now, you, you might say, well, but those could be good. Those could be good things, right? But to the extent that they will be protected, it won't be because they're in a constitution. It will be because they are uh, politicized and broadly accepted and acted upon. So I'm skeptical of this sort of constitutional symbolism. I'm also skeptical of the legal dynamics of constitutionalization because it tends to put power in the hands of um, judicial elites and they tend in turn to be um, expanding their own powers and that can have the impact of reducing the powers of the democratic political uh, process. Um, so overall uh, I would say you know, I'm I'm a, 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 a skeptic of constitutional uh, solutions, um, which doesn't mean that you couldn't envisage a constitution which protected the things I would like to protect. Only that I wouldn't have that faith in constitutions in do doing so. And we've seen that with social rights. We've seen the way social rights, for example, become marginalised uh, in the constitution. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I think the, well, I say the ordinary political process, but of course that also can function well or badly, depending upon the links that exist between society and um, the uh, political representatives. So it's not that parliamentary democracy will solve everything either. That, that will only be as good as the system of um, um, political representation. Um, but you know, given given the choice, at least the second one, I think, is more susceptible to some kind of democratic pressure from below. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, that's that's where I, I would rather um, put my put my trust in. Perfect. It's the question of effectiveness, as we said, right? Sometimes mm. we do have it in, in paper and text, but that we don't have it in reality, because there's a whole dialogue between them. And then we, we just go back to our our research group name, which is uh, just a system and state of exception. We actually do study the judiciary and how it actually sometimes creates, sometimes endorses exceptionalism in here in Brazil and Latin America in general. So yeah, <laughs> it does dialogue a lot with our research. So uh, Professor, I'm not taking you uh, longer and uh, please, I'll leave you to your kids. <laughs> Thank you so much for uh, this amazing morning for us, afternoon uh, for you. Yeah. I, 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 it was an honor to have you in our research group. No doubt your thinking will inspire us to discuss and debate many topics. I'll personally use a lot of you in, our, in my thesis. <laughs> Therefore, um, on behalf of Professors Pedro and Luis Manuel, I thank you for your presence. Uh, the doors of our research group are always open to you, and uh, I wish you an excellent week. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a huge pleasure and a, a privilege um, to to talk to you and you know to have such wonderful wonderful questions. And I, I look forward to, to further collaboration. <laughs> sure, sure. Let's think about something like that. So thank you, folks. As soon as we put the subtitles on, this video will be available on the group's YouTube channel basically forever. I um, hope you liked it. So see you later. See you next time. Thank yeah. you, Professor, once yeah. again. Bye-bye.